question, okay? So I just want to say thank you um, for inviting me to speak to you to, uh, tonight for the, at this dinner, um, honoring those of you ladies that serve in this church. And it's a blessing for me to see a church that wants to honor those who serve. And your leaders are being Christ-like in this. When you think about that, your leaders are being Christ-like in this to show you honor for your service, whatever that service is. I hope will remind you that God sees your service. God sees your service, not just your pastor who said he sees your service, but God sees your service. And he gives you joy and blessing that sometimes you don't see or recognize that God has blessed you. And I'm going to begin this by saying that we have just God that does not overlook your service, whatever that service is. And the passage of scripture that I'm going to use tonight to encourage you with is Hebrews 6, 10 and 11. And it's a passage, and I'm thankful my husband said, when you talk on a topic, he said, just take a passage. So he gave me several to choose from, and here it is. Mm -hmm. For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. As you still do, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have a full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. So we'll start with an attribute of God, which is God is just. God is fair in all his actions and judgments. He cannot overpunish or underpunish. Our God is a just God. And you're thinking, what is she talking about? But the passage said, God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. So consider in this way, God sees your love that you have shown as you serve the saints and he blesses you as you do it, as you do what's right. Usually when we think of justice, we think when we're doing something wrong, we have fear. When we do something right, we should stop and think about that we have his blessing. We have joy in serving Jesus. We are bearing fruit to his glory and by his grace. And when you think about that illustration of us bearing fruit, it's, it's, it should remind us of sweetness, sweetness in our soul as we're serving, in our speech and in all our relationships. Um, but for a believer, we're bearing fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what we're producing as we seek to walk in light of what Christ has done in, his, done in our hearts. So when you think, we forgive because he's forgiven us. We love because he first loved us. And we serve because he served. God incarnate came from heaven and he washed the disciples' feet. As an example that no service in this world should be too lowly for us to do. Jesus reminded his disciples in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And so, you know, as I was asked to do this talk, um, and it was Steve Ballinger that tossed my name out there, um, and I began to pray, should I do this or should I not? Um, and my hope and prayer is that this would be an evening of encouragement for those who those of you who have been serving in ways that are, you know, recognized, because some people think, well, we're honoring Sunday school teachers, we're honoring those who, you know, are doing very visible acts of service. But I also want to encourage those of you who may be discouraged because you don't feel like you're serving, or you don't feel like you do enough, and maybe to lift up hands that have gotten weary in your service, in your labor. I want all of you ladies to leave here tonight knowing that you are blessed, and I want you to have a bit more joy in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your relationship with others as well. So the first point is, and I'm going to repeat my point several times in here, so hopefully you'll go home with that reminder, because it takes a lot for me to remember things. I've gotten older, it's gotten worse. Um, <laughs> yeah, my boys just laugh at my lack of memory, because they've got very good memories. I have four sons. My first point is God does not overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. We all want to be noticed for what we do. We want to be thanked by our husbands, by our friends, our bosses, children. We want them to notice that we cooked a good meal. Those men did a very good job cooking the meal, and we're thankful for that. And we can honor them as they seek to honor you. But we want them to notice that we've cooked a good meal and we did the laundry, we planned, we taught a Sunday school class, uh, we, maybe we planned a good get-together. 
It gives us satisfaction, right, ladies? When you realize that someone has noticed that the laundry is done, because they definitely notice if it's not. Um, because we know that we're made their day, e their day easier, um, and or that you've just encouraged them by what you did in ministering to them. And that's a good thing. We know that God is everywhere, right? You all understand that God is everywhere. We know that God sees everything, he knows all things, so why should it surprise us when I say that God sees your service to the saints and he is pleased? It shouldn't surprise us, but it does. Even if no one says good job or thank you, God sees, God knows, God blesses. It makes me think of a song by a lady named Judy Rogers, and it goes like this. I'm hiding from mommy and nobody knows. I'm hiding and no one can tell. But I just remember that God watches me. He knows everything that I do. I cannot see God, but he always sees me. Nothing can be hid from God. That's a song helping children to learn the catechism question that God is everywhere. And it's usually in regard to doing something naughty. You know, when I'm in the kitchen and no one's around, I think I can sneak and get cookies. <laughs> but God watches, and that song reminds him of that. And we think that way when we have sinful behavior, but I want you to think about God seeing your good behavior. God sees that as well, and he is pleased. So you have God's pleasure. I like the definition of service in a book that we sell. It's called Our 24 Family Ways by Clay Clarkson. Service is doing for others without expecting them to do anything for me in return. You know, I don't need to expound on that. Or you can meditate on what your expectation on why you serve. Is it to get glory for yourself? Or is your mindset to glorify God, knowing that he sees you, he sees the motives of your heart? And if your mindset is to glorify God, then you will enjoy him forever because you'll be knowing that you do what pleases the Lord. Um, we should not expect anything in return for our service. We shouldn't be serving and giving hugs so we'll get a hug in return or anything else. Um, but I will remind you that we should be giving thanks in all things. So as people serve us, we should remember to say thank you. The men that have served tonight, remember to thank them. When people do a kind thing for you, to give them thanks. Or if you see someone ministering, to give thanks. If you thank Sunday school teachers, or if you see youth in the church reaching out and doing things, make sure you give them thanks. So they're ministering to other kids. Or they're laboring to set up tables. Um, we should not expect anything in return for our service, but cultivating a grateful community of servants is a blessing. Think about that. A, gr a grateful community of servants is a blessing. So how should I view my labor or my service or my ministry in the kingdom? Because sometimes you think, well, it's labor, it's hard. But your service, your ministry, and those two words are interchangeable. I came across that passage in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, and it's a passage that speaks of the final judgment. And I think many of you might be aware of that passage. When the Son of Man was separate sheep from the goats, sheep on his right that will inherit the kingdom of heaven, and goats on the left that will be cast into the eternal fire. And how are they judged in that passage? Okay, here's how the passage is reading. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you sick and in prison or visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. So when you're doing it to the least in the kingdom of heaven, you're doing it to the Lord. And if you read the rest of that passage, he goes through the same thing. And the wicked are like, you know, you didn't do anything for anybody. And so when you think, um, as I was doing this lesson, and Tuesday night I was kind of reworking, working on it, and a striking providence happened. I got a text from a sister, her name's Stephanie, and it's her sister-in-law who's in prison for murdering her husband. It's a recent incident, and shocking to say the least, when it happened, as I know her sister-in-law, but God brought that text along as I'm reading, I was in prison and you came to me. Because I'm thinking those in prison, people that you think of in prison, are usually people like in the persecuted church. But as I'm thinking and praying about this lesson, that text comes in, 
And Stephanie was letting a group of ladies who are praying and sending notes to her sister-in-law who's in prison because this incident happened only about six weeks ago. And the kids were in the home. It's a, it's a second or third marriage for the sister-in-law. And she was giving an update on the current situation. And I'm looking at the passage. I was in prison and you came to me. So there's a group of ladies in this prison right now. And uh, the sister-in-law is one of them. And I'm thinking, what can I do to serve them? I prayed for this lady that's in prison right now. I prayed for her conversion and her first husband's conversion. And I'm seeing God work. I don't know the end, but I know that I can serve this one in prison by saying and sending a note and praying. The procrastinator in me would say the note is work. Write note, writing notes for me is work. For some people, it's, that is the easy part. I'm praying about the situation. I've prayed for this lady and her husband, her first husband for a long time if they're on my prayer card but that came at that time and it made me stop and think I was in prison and you came to me what does that look like so think about those points so I'm going to move on so the first point was God does not overlook your work and the love that you've shown for his name and serving the saints and the second point is this service is not only meeting physical needs but spiritual needs as well so when you run through that list, list um, you had having clothing, food, naked and being dressed. But there are spiritual needs that are also met. And that's why I think that I was in prison and you came to me of praying for people. Um, we live in a time and a place that more often than not, those that are hungering are not suffering from a physical hunger, but they're suffering from a spiritual hunger. They're they're hungering for spiritual bread and milk. The longing for a drink of life-giving water. They need to be clothed in the gospel of Christ. They suffer from that prison, or they're in that prison of depression or anxiety. Right now, there's a lot of anxious people out there. There are a lot of depressed people. You can't help but hear about the suicide rating, rate going up. And a kind word, a text, will help in that gloom for someone who cares. So sometimes it's a spiritual need that's being met, not just physical. So you may be taking meals, that's a good thing. Helping someone with kids. Some of you right now, tonight, you've got kids helping kids or dad staying at home, helping clean, write a note. But what does meeting a spiritual need, what does that look like, a spiritual need? And when I was doing this lesson, I was reading in Romans, and I thought, oh, this is interesting, an example of spiritual service that you may not have thought about in terms of it being a spiritual service. Romans 1 9 says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. As soon as that word serve came up, I thought, oh, I'm teaching on serving. So there it is. So if you, if you ladies teach, you know that God brings those words along your path, teaching along your path, and it's here. So I look at the note in my study Bible, and it says, and this is what the study note says about that um, serving in his spirit. Paul's constant prayerfulness is an expression of his wholehearted service and desire for spiritual usefulness. Praying for one another is a way to serve the body of Christ. Praying for one another. I don't know how much you guys pray for each other, but you'd be surprised at who doesn't pray for one another, who doesn't really know each other in the body of Christ. And it doesn't have to be a big body either. I'm just, sometimes I'm surprised. For me, I'm trying to send two text messages a day to someone I'm praying for that day. Someone I might not be in contact with, maybe an older friend, um, just to say, I'm praying for you. Um, so an example of this would be, I was sitting with some friends, a couple, and we were at a fellowship time. And I asked the husband how his mom was doing, because I'd met his mother. Um, I found out there were difficulties in the relationship, and you can tell he was kind of taken aback. He said her birthday was coming up and it was going to be difficult. So I sent him a text and said, I'm praying for you this week. I limited, and I've read a book, and it just mentioned, sometimes if you're praying for someone, you don't have to pray for them every day to say you're praying for them. But I, I committed that week to pray for him, his wife, and his mom. And that reaching out opened other doors of ministry to that family. They're willing to share their heart. And so therefore, I have other areas to pray for. I, so I, now I know some of their heartache because there's a difficulty. Whenever there's difficulty in family, as you all know, because I'm sure every one of you has somebody difficult in your family. So consider how you might reach out to love one another and thus fulfill the law of Christ. And, and one way is to pray without ceasing. To come up with 
a way to find out how you can pray for one another. And I'm going to give you an illustration that might be helpful to encourage you to reach out and then to pray. We had a family visit our church, and I know that you know you have a church out here in the country, but you'll get visitors. I noticed the wife was Asian, her husband Caucasian, found out she was from Indonesia. Um, I talked to her a bit one week and I began to pray, like, how do I reach out to her? Because the husband said, Yanita's English isn't very good. She's only been here three and a half years. Um, and I'm thinking, how could I serve her? And so I started praying for her and her husband. And what did God do? And this is always amazing to see what God does. I'm sitting at a ch church. We have lunch on Sunday at our church. And so I'm sitting and talking to her. And I knew she was from Indonesia. I said, where in Indonesia are you from? And she said, I'm from Jakarta. That's where she had lived and that's where she had worked. She's in her 30s. That same Sunday evening, I go to an evening a missions conference at another church. Um, my husband didn't go with me, but I knew who the speaker was. He was from the Master's Academy International, which is a branch of, um, from John MacArthur's church. And it's a ministry training pastors around the world. And do you know where one of those training centers is? It's in Jakarta. It wasn't in Bali, Borneo, or Bangdong. The training center was in Jakarta. So how many times have you heard of Jakarta? And how many times have you heard of Jakarta the same day in two places? <laughs> and so they're totally, unre I mean, to to totally unrelated things. And so connections have been made for this, this lady who her husband thinks she has faith, but he's not sure because she doesn't talk. And there's somewhat of a language barrier there. But she can now connect to a place where there's solid teaching over there in Jakarta and hear it in her own tongue. And there's a joy in seeing God work as you pray and you see God work. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. But I also want to note that there are others in the church who welcome this family who chose to help help with their baby, help make contact with a mutual friend who was also from Indonesia. There are those who sat and talked with her and her husband. We never know when those opportunities of small things are working to larger and larger things in the kingdom of God. You just don't know. Okay, so now we're going to go back to verse 11 in Hebrews 6. I like to tell stories because that's what God's doing. Um, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. So there is this next part of that. For those of you who are struggling with how to serve, or you know that you're sluggish in serving, it says to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. So there's an imitation part here. So we know that God's not overlooking your work and the love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints. And we know that the second point was Service is not only meeting physical needs, but spiritual needs as well. And the third point is strive to be imitators of those who are serving. Um, when my husband, Dennis, and I met, we met in a church in New Jersey. And this church encouraged families to open their homes to take in singles. There were a lot of singles in this church because they were coming to hear the teaching of, at Trinity Baptist Church in New Jersey. And they were coming from all over the place. Some were just new to the area, moving in. Some were college students. Um, so when Dennis and I, we were married, um, I, probably a year and a half after joining the church there, we started taking in singles. Because that was an example of others that were taking in singles into our home. Yeah, they paid a little rent, but they would have dinner with us and things of that sort. Um, the church also encouraged us to welcome the stranger into our homes. Um, it, was, it was pretty striking back then. We were reminded that if someone was visiting the church as a stranger, that newcomer should have at least one or two invitations into our homes. And we had a friend visit us that we knew back in then, and Regina, who was a real women's liver, converted, was an artist, Archie Comics, said, you know, I was invited. She said, I was so caught off guard being invited by two or three families when I first came to church at Trinity. And that triggered that reminder that that was encouraged from the pulpit. Um, that people should be invited into our homes. And later on, that, that same church, Trinity Baptist, had a church dinner on after the morning service, and you could invite people to that meal and then to go out and evangelize. So we have a Sunday lunch at our church every Sunday. Uh, people come in from 30, 45 minutes, so they just have lunch every Sunday in fellowship. I make sure I fix extra food so that, that I can tell the newcomer come join us. I've always made extra food in case they've got some hesitancy. So that's part of the imitation part. But there are other people that you can learn from. 
as you look around the room, I don't know you ladies, but for me, there is a family at our church who opens their home often, and what I'm learning from them and trying to imitate a little bit more is I love to cook. I do love to cook, and I struggle with cleaning. Um, and I can make meals too complex. I once cooked a full turkey dinner on a Wednesday night before prayer reading to a new family in the church, and it was way, way overdone. <laughs> We're not called to perfection. They didn't come to eat my food. We're called to serve one another in love. It's not a competition. And there's another lady in the church. When the call for a meal goes out, we use um, take them a meal, and she takes the same meal. She keeps it simple. She always keeps those ingredients on hand. So if a meal, and I need to learn from people like that and to imitate that more often. I have another friend when it comes to praying. I, she asked me, how can I pray for you? And this is when I was at that missions conference. She's from another church. I said, pray about this lesson. She said, okay. She, we stood on the church step with all these people around us and we stood there and prayed. She said, if I, she said, if I tell you I'm gonna pray, she said, I'm gonna forget. So she said, I just need to pray right now. So she did. And that's an example to me of someone who's not shy in the midst of a crowd of people to stand there, bow your heads, and to pray and to seek the Lord. So I've learned from my sisters in Christ how to better serve the body of Christ. So consider who will you imitate? Who do you admire as they serve their families, their parents, their children, their coworkers, church members, strangers, neighbors, and the list goes on. We learn from one another whether we know it or not. We do learn from one another. <coughs> Um, right now at our, our church we have a men's group, it's called Men Indeed, and once a month they go do projects for older people in the church. And I thought that was really cool, people that can't do it for themselves. Sometimes you have physical limitations. There was a, there's a, two ladies in Louisville, Kentucky, my son went to Southern a Theological Seminary. Um, but I heard about two ladies that had meals on heels. They, they dressed up in heels, and if you were chosen from that, in that church body, they would bring you meal. It didn't have to be that you were moving, having a baby, or had somebody sick. It's just they wanted to be a blessing. So you had a, something to pick from, and they dressed up, and they brought you dinner. And, they, and that's how they would like to serve, all dressed up in their heels, and that's what they called it. And I've always wanted to do that, but I haven't. I don't wear heels, but anyway. <laughs> But for some of you that have physical limitations, um, I have a, a dear friend, she sends cards. I know another lady in a wheelchair, she called people that were miss, missing on Monday. If they missed church on Sunday, they got a call from the window on, on a Monday. And so sometimes you see those things, you're thinking, well, I can't do that, but I can do this. Um, so, and sometimes we have just flat out discipleship. And I don't know if you practice that in this church, but we don't do a, a ton of that at our church, but I had a young lady who asked me to teach her how to cook, and I, I enjoy cooking, and so I said, well, what do you want to learn how to cook? And she said, anything with potatoes. And for someone who was raised on rice, I'm Japanese, <laughs> it was just kind of like, oh, I said, you could do fried potatoes, mashed potatoes, you could put it in soup, and, and she just, she said, I don't care, just so it's got potatoes in it. So um, that was really a funny moment. Um, but our time together became a time to minister to her, she's 19, in her walk with the Lord and, help, help, and helped her to think about and focus on her family. Um, her mom would tell you she, her mom was not a good cook and they had a, a, a severely disabled child in the home. Um, everyone had different opinions on food, but I wanted her to think and create dialogue in her household of how she could serve her family, not just think about her potatoes, but what kind of meals that would help her family and be a blessing to them. And it also helped me to understand her family, the dynamics in the family, to understand how to minister to the family and how to pray for that family as well. Um, another way to find those to imitate is to read biography. I've learned much by reading He Delighted in God about George Mueller. That's probably my favorite book that I've read early this year about his prayer life and what, how God answers prayer. And George Mueller journaled his prayer and his his autobiography is huge, and so I don't pick up big books. They're too heavy for me. <laughs> anyway, um, but this is a, a smaller abridged, and, but it just covers all how he prayed and how God answered, and he journaled it. Um, the Gospel Comes with a House Key by Rosaria Butterfield, who is a converted transgender professor um, that God saved because pastor invited her into her home. It took a couple years, but he invited her and invited her, thought about how Someone in that lifestyle, very often they're vegetarian, um, and they were very considerate of her, and she covers, the gospel comes with the house key, covers the importance of hospitality. 
And the list goes on. For some of you, you might have to share, oh, I read this book and this is what I learned from it. But now I'm going to have some miscellaneous thoughts because I didn't know where to stick this. <laughs> Don't feel guilty if you have to say no. You can't do it all. For some of you that are just, go get them. And I've had to tell one sister that. She said, is it bad for me to say no? And this lady is doing a ton of things. And I said, no, you don't have time. And you don't feel that you're calling. You can say no. Don't feel guilty. Because um, you don't want other things to suffer. Sometimes you have to tell someone to move out of their comfort zone. I had to tell a sister, I said, you need to move out of your comfort zone. You need to greet the stranger. Don't tell me that I didn't know anybody there, therefore I was real clingy to my boyfriend. I said, I'm walking into a group of ladies, I don't know a single one of you here. I don't know any one of you here. I've, I've never met any of you. So, I know the Ballingers who would have told me to come here. So, <laughs> so am I sluggish? Am I just procrastinating? Am I being selfish so I don't serve, don't minister? Just, just hold back on any form of ministry. Um, so just think about that. Am I sluggish like me sending a note to the, the, the friend in prison? Um, I can procrastinate on card writing. Some of it is I cannot spell. And so I start to write and the spelling gets crazy. Then the writing, if I'm tired, is all sloppy and I've got all my excuses. So anyway, and so sometimes I need to just kind of suck it up and say, no, I'm going to do this and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to actually do it. Okay, here's another question. Do, you, do I only serve to be noticed? If so, you already have your reward. It's what Jesus said to the humble sheep. It's what Jesus said. It's to the humble sheep that had to be reminded that they, that they did those acts of love. You notice that. I didn't know that, you know, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? So... Sometimes you have to catch yourself. Are you doing it out of pride? Are you doing it just as a payback? Sometimes people will invite you over and say, well, you invited me, so now I have to invite you. That should not be our thought life when it comes to having people in our home or, or doing whatever service there is. Pray for a mindset of service. Humble yourself and ask a sister to pray for you and with you that Maybe she'll help you see where you're lacking, thinking, I know I should be doing more, but what is it? What do you see? Where, where, where's my giftedness? Now, for some of you, if you're thinking, what is my giftedness? I have heard a pastor say, if, you're, if you feel called to something, and that's what you're going to do, you're not going to get tired of it. And so go for it. Um, I cooked um, at a previous church. I cooked the Wednesday night dinner, and the, one of the elders kept saying, you're going to get tired. You're going to get tired. I thought, I love to cook. I had, I had to back off, keeping it too complex, because you can't feed 60, 70, 80 people in 30 minutes. If you have it too complex, there's too many choices. So you have to keep it simple. But sometimes you need to just stop and think and ask someone and pray about what I could be doing. Okay, I'm not a seasoned teacher. I don't do what I'm doing tonight often. I have one session that I do at homeschool conferences. When he said I spoke at homeschool conferences, <laughs> it's entitled From Grumbling to Gratitude. I've taught it about six to eight times. Um, the points are journaling, writing down God's blessings each day. The second is others, serving others. And and because um, if you serve others, serving others will keep you humble so you won't grumble. And the third point is yearn to grow in gratitude. And so journaling others and yearning, it spells joy. And so, but considering others and how to serve them, it gives us joy and we become more Christ-like as we serve. Um, and there are so many ways to serve one another. It means dying to self. And that's always the hard part, dying to self, humbling yourself, considering others more important than yourself. But isn't that what Christ did for us? Isn't that what Christ did for us? He left his father's throne. He humbled himself to be born in a stable. He suffered humiliation at the hands of religious folks. It wasn't the world that was after him. It was the religious folks. He washed the disciples' feet. And that he did right before he died. And then he rose again. What an example for us to imitate. So I'm just going to review the points so you have them in your head. <laughs> because for me, I can hear a sermon. And I could go away and I'm thinking, what did he say? <laughs> I listened to one of my son's husband's sermon. He said, well, you've heard that one before. And I'm thinking, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> there are people that can tell you a sermon point for point. 
I cannot do that. So, my, our three points tonight were God does not overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and serving the saints. Service is not only meeting physical needs, but spiritual needs as well. And third was strive to be imitators of those who are serving. Um, ladies, as you take to heart what you have heard here tonight, be encouraged in the Lord. Be encouraged in the Lord. The fact that you have a church that wanted to honor you, ladies, and have the men serve you, that's a real blessing. It's a blessing that I've not heard of another church that does this. And we've been around a lot of churches. And so it's always fun because then I go home and say, you know what, we did, they had the men. Because I, I had no idea that the men were going to serve you tonight. Um, we are part of the body of Christ. We work together. And the fact the men have encouraged you tonight, and I'm encouraged to see them serving and working. And you just remember, the Lord sees your service, whatever it is. The fact you've gone up and given someone a hug because they needed it, maybe they didn't know they needed it, and then they start crying in your arms. Mm -hmm. um, and that should give us reason to rejoice in the Lord always. And Because the Lord is good, isn't he? He's good all the time. And as you serve one another, as you pray for one another, as you see how God answers prayer. I prayed the other day that I needed to have a conversation with a young lady that works for us. And I prayed that God would help me because it was her day off. And she called, she texted that morning. She said, can I come to the office and work on the shelves today? And I'm thinking, oh, Lord answered that prayer really quick. And I was thinking, now I'm going to be able to And so when you see things like that and you write things like that down, because I was telling her, you need to write things down so you remember what God's done and how he's blessed. Because in your serving, you see, and as you pray, you see what God's doing, and it is great. It's amazing. And in this day and age, as society's falling apart around us, and people are very self-focused, we need to be able to give thanks and know how to reach out, how to minister, and how to pray. So, do you want me to pray now, or is he coming? <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, let me pray for us, and then we'll tell Kyle to come back. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for how you have loved us, how you have brought us together, these ladies together as a body of believers, to, to work together, to serve you. I pray that they would know your blessing in their lives as they seek to encourage one another, as they seek to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us, and you gave us the grace and the strength to... To, to, to labor and to serve you. Help us to evaluate our own hearts and minds. Help us to rejoice in you. Help us to serve more in areas that we see that we're lacking. Help us to be imitators of, of those around us that, that you have surrounded us with. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Christ's name.